Good afternoon and welcome. As people arrive and find their seats, uh, we thought it would be nice to begin with a little photo montage that our staff put together with the family. And uh, so it's about four minutes, so just uh, enjoy it. I think you'll get, it'll bring back a lot of memories to a lot of us.
welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Rehm. I'm president of the Fund for American Studies. And most importantly, I've known, had the privilege of knowing Jay Parker for 40 years of my life. I first met him in 1975 in Chicago at a convention of Young Americans for Freedom when I was a college student. And if I, my calculation's right, he was only 38 at the time, though he seemed like an old and wise man to me, <laughs> even then. Uh, I uh, was thinking about the fact that when I was hired by David Jones to become Executive Vice President of the Fund for American Studies in 1991, one of the first things he did before completing the deal to hire me was he brought me here to the University Club to have breakfast with Jay. And uh, I had breakfast with several other board members of the organization, but the breakfast with Jay was very unusual. He first question I think he asked me when David Jones said, I want to hire Roger to be the executive vice president of the fund, is he said, well, what other jobs are you going to have? <laughs> he said, you've got to have several jobs in your life. You can't just have one job. You need a lot of jobs going at once. And <laughs> great discussion at breakfast. And I took the job and had the opportunity to work with him as he served on our board for many years. The one thing we shared in a perverse way was one of the great days of my life was the worst day of Jay Parker's life. It was in 1967 when my Packers beat his Cowboys in the ice bowl. <laughs> and I remember in this room in, at his 70th birthday party presenting him with a blown up photo of Bart Starr crossing the goal line <laughs> on, that, on the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field. But I just marveled as I watched that whether the photos were posed or not, Jay had that big radiant smile on his face. Uh, that light, lit up all of our lives for so many years, and we were so blessed. Uh, what is remarkable about Jay Parker was his belief in service to others, his profound understanding of the dignity of every one of God's children, his commitment to, per, uh, to individual freedom and personal responsibility. It was just remarkable, and it was an example, I think, to all of us and influenced us all. We've asked some people today to, to speak about their uh, privilege of working with Jay, and I'm just going to serve as someone to give brief introductions to each of them. I thought I would begin, and I think this would be appropriate for Jay Parker, to just read a short passage. There's, there's a loose wire here somewhere on the podium, but uh, from uh, Scripture. It's from Mark 9. And uh, it's, it, 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 I'll read it to you. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the ho house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the 12, and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. And I just, I, 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 when I heard that, read that scripture recently, I thought of Jay Parker, because he was a servant to all of us in his life, and a servant to so many in his life. Uh, in the Washington Times piece, that was run in their, the paper today. If you haven't seen it, we have copies outside. Jay wrote just a beautiful, really, an obituary about his life. And I sent it to an editor there, David Keene, and said, would you run this in the Washington Times? And David said, you need to turn it into an op-ed. And so I, I looked at it with feeling like I was writing it with Jay Parker as my co-author. And it's certainly more Jay Parker than it is Roger Ream, I think. But I, tried to add a few stories and uh, honor him in that. But I mentioned in there the one book that he always uh, talked about with me, and that's Richard Cornell's book, Reclaiming the American Dream, published in 1965, that was a call to service. It was an effort to tell liberals and conservatives uh, that they need to engage in uh, service and community and civic organizations. And Jay Parker did that throughout his life and was an example to so many in that regard. Well, our first speaker uh, this afternoon is Lee Edwards. Lee is truly the historian of the conservative movement. 
He's a distinguished fellow at the Heritage Foundation, uh, found, uh, co-founder and chairman of the Victims of Communism Foundation, worked with Jay uh, over the decades uh, as a uh, leader in the conservative movement, uh, and uh, I won't do justice to all of Lee's accomplishments, but please welcome Lee Edwards. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. What a great smile. Uh, and that's why uh, I've said that a day without Jay was like a day without sunshine. He was always smiling, always impeccably dressed in a Brooks Brothers suit and vest with polished, and I mean highly polished, shoes. And of course, a fedora. He was the master of PMA, always a positive mental attitude. Nothing seemed to face him. And we shared space and clients and dreams for over a decade. We were, in fact, the first integrated public affairs firm in Washington, D.C. He was a natural leader. And I brought Jay into the Washington Kiwanis. And within a couple of years, he was the president of the most influential fraternal organization in Washington, D.C. He was a man in demand on the board of nearly every charity in Washington. Salvation Army, Goodwill, Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind, and I know I'm leaving out a half a dozen or more. His signal contribution to the conservative movement, I think, aside from being one of the founders of Young Americans for Freedom, was the formation of the Lincoln Institute and its journal, The Lincoln Review, which was filled with articles, always, about the first principles of our republic and how to apply them to the problems of today. The Lincoln Review never had a large circulation, but it justified its existence one day when Jay got a telephone call that began, my name is Clarence Thomas, and I like what you have to say. <laughs> and for 40 minutes, Jay mostly listened to Clarence, a legislative assistant to Senator John Danforth of Missouri, talking about politics, black and white relations, and how he enjoyed reading the review's views on free enterprise, limited government, and traditional American values. And Clarence said, I thought I was the only one out there. <laughs> and it was the beginning of a close and enduring friendship between the young black lawyer who became an associate justice of the Supreme Court and the man who I say is the founding father of the modern black conservative movement in America. Jay was independent, optimistic, courageous, Gibraltar solid, in his beliefs. We'll miss him, but we'll never forget him. Rest in peace, Jay. Rest in peace. Thank you very much, Lee. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Walter Williams, the John M. Olin Distinguished Professor of Economics at George Mason University. As you all know, Walter is the author of more than 10 books, the, one of the most recent being Up From the Projects, an autobiograph, uh, autobiography of his upbringing, which he shared with Jay in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Walter. Uh, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I guess it was uh, Tom Sowell and I, we worked together for the Urban Institute in 1971, 1973. And I had never met Jay, and I, and I still did not meet him until 1978. But uh, Tom Sowell was telling me that uh, 
Well, if we wanted to have a pinochle game among black conservatives, it would have to be cutthroat. <laughs> it wouldn't be enough for, to play partners. <laughs> But uh, that's a different story uh, today. And, uh, but my, my first meeting uh, with Jay was uh, through uh, telephone conversations. I, I lived in, uh, in Valley Forge, uh, Pennsylvania, where I still live in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And, um, and we had been talking on the phone, and we were exchanging ideas about some of my publications. And, um, and so Jay said, well, well, can I come up and we'll, I'll take you to dinner, you and your wife to, to, to dinner. And so he knocked on the door, and I opened the door, and I was shocked. Because I thought it would be a white guy. <laughs> I mean, I mean this, uh, I, this, you know, he is a yaffer and into all these other things. <laughs> So I went up, my wife was dressing. I ran up, went up and told her, and I said, he's a black guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so we both were uh, mutually shocked. Uh, but but uh, all the time I, and, and matter of fact, that was kind of a turning point in my life because uh, uh, Jay invited me to certain affairs uh, in Washington, D.C. And one of the affairs was, uh, I met Orrin, Senator Orrin Hatch and Senator Hayakawa, and, uh, and Jay had, a, uh, had arranged a, a reception uh, for me, uh, including those senators and other people. And I told them that, uh, well, I, I just completed a study for the Joint Economic Committee of Congress, and they weren't, uh, they were f refusing to publish it. And matter of fact, the, subject, the, uh, the uh, study was called uh, youth and Minority Unemployment, where I criticized the Minimum Wage and the Davis-Bacon Act, and the, uh, and the members of Congress, uh, they just did not like it. And so, uh, so the next day, I got a call from the Joint Economic Committee of Congress saying that they would publish it. Evidently, Orrin Hatch and, uh, and Senator Hayakawa, uh, they uh, uh, brought the music to the people on the committee. <laughs> but. Uh, <coughs> But I, as, as many of you know, uh, Jay has, uh, he's always been a very, very loyal uh, friend. Uh, I've enjoyed many conversations with him, and I've known him, oh, this is almost uh, 40 years. Uh, I've known him through that time and, and, and with his uh, charming wife and daughter. And uh, he's a great person, and I will surely uh, miss him. And he's done a whole lot for everybody in our country, uh, regardless of race, but he's been, he's been instrumental in pointing out the founding principles of our country. And he's demanded, and he's asked us to live up to those principles. And I will surely miss him. Thank you very much. Many of us I know uh, had opportunities to come to this club to be with Jay Parker. Uh, might have been for a breakfast meeting, which he loved to do. Uh, he also regularly held the meetings of his uh, Lincoln Institute in the back room there and brought a lot of uh, great speakers in, uh, brought good people together for breakfast discussions. I think that may be where I met our next speaker, Darren, Darian Waters, who's uh, I think someone who Jay, along with many others, met early in Darren's development in his career and, and really helped him along the way, introduced him to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see Darren that often, but we, I think we feel like great friends and brothers because of the, our connection through Jay Parker. Darren's the uh, assistant professor of history at UNC Asheville in Asheville, North Carolina. Darren. Thank you so much, Roger. And also, just thank you, Mrs. Parker and Ashley, for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about <clears throat> Mr. Parker. I could never call him anything but Mr. Parker. <laughs> Even though he would call me and say, this is Jay, I could never call him anything else but Mr. Parker. But he was a man who, I, who was truly my mentor, my friend, and he was my confidant. 
Um, but I wonder, but how, because this is a difficult one. Um, after nearly 25 years of a shared experience with someone who was so meaningful in my life, when you asked me to do this, I thought, how do I capture that in just a few brief minutes? It's very difficult. I had three major mentors. He was one of them. Connor Cruz O'Brien was the other. John Hope Franklin was the other. And all three are gone. And so I wonder what that means. Someone told me that means you now mentor other people. That's true. But like so many of us here, we spent such a significant amount of time with, with Mr. Parker, a significant amount of time together. I had the opportunity to travel with him, to travel with you, Mrs. Parker, and Ashley on some great trips that we went on. He exposed me to a larger world. Um, 35 years ago this year, I lost another important man in my life, my grandfather. And when I met Mr. Parker, one of the things that stood out to me was how much they were so alike. In fact, my mother said this when she met Mr. Parker, they're so similar to each other. So it was like my grandfather was replaced uh, by Mr. Parker. Um, so how do you capture that in just a few brief minutes, the meaning of this? I concluded that I would just briefly highlight some traits that really attracted me to Mr. Parker here. Um, there are many, but the ones that were most prominent to me as we uh, share time together, the things that drew me to him. Um, I hope that these are traits that I now possess and that I will be able to pass on, uh, not only to my sons but to other people, because that was one of the commitments that he made me make, uh, that you will do what, what you and I have done together for people other than your own sons. One of the traits that drew me to Mr. Parker from the very beginning was his wealth of knowledge when we met deep, deep knowledge. I felt that I learned more from him than I learned in the four years that I spent in undergraduate school. <laughs> the plethora of books that he uh, introduced me to led me to believe that the state of Virginia should have uh, just empowered him to be able to issue diplomas. <laughs> He was truly a one-man university, so much that you learn, you could learn from him, and I'm so happy to say that I have the opportunity to pass that information on to the students that I now engage at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. Another trait that really stood out to me was his patience. He was very patient, very patient with me. Uh, we would sit calmly together, and he would listen to what I would have to say. He would listen to my laundry list of complaints about uh, what I believe to be the unnecessary lengthiness of my post-baccalaureate years, um, especially going through the position as a probation and parole officer, moving from that on into graduate school. But he listened patiently, and at the end of the day, he would always say, you have work to do. Go back, get to your work. So his patience was something that was stood out to me greatly. Um, finishing my dissertation when Mr. Parker was sick, uh, Mrs. Parker and I had a conversation when he was, uh, he had to be put in a, a coma right, uh, to get well and I worried greatly that, um, that I would not get a chance to see him and I had a phone conversation with Mrs. Parker on the phone. I was in Asheville working on my dissertation trying to finish this process and I asked her then, can I come to Washington to see him? And she said, he gave me specific instructions. You are not to come here until you can tell us that you have finished a PhD. <laughs> Another trait that stood out to me, and this is the last, was his sense of humor. Laughter, as you know, is good for the soul, and we laughed a lot. Ironically, one of the shows that we both loved was Seinfeld. And one of the things that we would say all the time to each other is he would say, Darren, in my mind, I'm already there. <laughs> so when Seinfeld would come on episodes of Seinfeld every year, when, when it was, in, uh, was on the air, he would, uh, he would call me every, after every episode, and we would have a long conversation just laughing about Seinfeld. So his sense of humor attracted, to me, attracted me to him as well. There are so many others that stand out to me, but no time to go into those here. But when I arrived here in town last night, my father driving in from Asheville, 
Mr. Parker, I only saw him one time in Philadelphia. Right? This is Mr. Parker's space. And when I came here last night and we stayed out near Great Falls, it, it occurred to me that this is really real. He's not here. And so it became even more real to me then. Um, I apologize, for, but it's, it's hard. Um, so this is really real, but we have work to do to carry on his legacy. And so I thought about how do I end my comments, and I, I will end them with Lincoln, who uh, he so admired. And Lincoln, in his second uh, inaugural me annual message to uh, Congress, um, he was contemplating emancipation then, you know, how to continue to prosecute this war and to end it as soon as possible. But there's a statement in that speech that uh, the, the address to the second to, uh, to Congress that he uh, gave, and it stands out to me when I think about Mr. Parker. And Lincoln said this, he said, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. It will light us down, history that is, it will light us down in honor or dishonor. For Mr. Parker, history, which is encapsulated in the memories we carry of him, will light him down in honor. It has already done that. His life, his was a life that was well lived. He planted seeds of knowledge, patience, and humor in us all. He watered them with tremendous care and compassion through the example of servant leadership. And now we have grown and we must carry on his legacy. Thank you. Well, now I'm uh, pleased to uh, introduce uh, a violin duet, which will be performed by Story Jones and Nita Sudlow. Uh, they are members of the Holy Trinity Church in Fairfax, Virginia. Father Josiah Jones is here from the church. Where are you? Oh, in the back, in the back. Uh, but uh, we really appreciate you being here today, and thank you, Ashley, for arranging this.
Thank you so much. I would now like to introduce uh, Mike Thompson. Mike is the president and founder of the Thomas Jefferson Institute for Public Policy in Virginia. He is the vice chairman of the board of the Fund for American Studies. Uh, he goes way back with Jay, and uh, I recall that when word came of Jay's passing, uh, Mike's son, Mike Jr., wrote a wonderful tribute on Facebook uh, that referred to Jay as his uncle and uh, someone who his son would very much miss. Uh, Mike was kind enough to represent the Fund for American Studies in Philadelphia at the services because Randy and I were uh, in China when we learned of uh, Jay's passing. Mike Thompson. Thank you, Roger. Jay Parker was a true icon of our conservative movement. We're here because Jay touched each of us in some special way. He was a friend, an ally, a pioneer, a community leader. He was a true and effective community organizer in all the positive aspects of what that means. He was a mentor, a leader, a philosopher, an historian. And Jay was editor, as we have heard, of that unique magazine, The Lincoln Review, that had a, that had a huge impact on all who read it. Indeed, some are here today precisely because they read that publication. And Jay was a sports fanatic. But most important of all, Jay was a loving father and husband. When he reconnected with his high school sweetheart, his life changed. Dolores made Jay's life whole, and it was added significantly by Ashley. What a wonderful love story we saw unfold in front of us. I met Jay here in Washington, D.C., the 1965 Yaf National Convention when I was first elected to the board to serve with him in that organization. My wife, Kit, met him in 1967 at the Pittsburgh Convention. Jay was my campaign manager when I ran for re-election that year with Alan McKay heading the ticket. Alan and Helen are with us today. Jay had an open invitation to stay at my parents' house in St. Louis whenever he was traveling and speaking for GAF. He was welcome at any time. He just had to make a call from the airport and say he's here, and, and he was welcome. My family adopted Jay, and we considered him part of us, as so many of us here today did. For 16 years, Jay sat on the board of the Fund for American Studies in our early years and helped us build the successful organization we have today that brought our reasoned conservative philosophy to over 15,000 student leaders over the years. Jay was one of those special people who come into our lives every so often. And each and every one of us here today is truly blessed that God allowed that to happen. Jay filled the void. Jay was just such a wonderful guy. Remember that classic Christmas film, It's a Wonderful Life? The story was about a good neighbor, George Bailey, who just lives his life day by day, doing what he does best to help people. And when George Bailey questions his purpose of life in life, his guardian angel shows him all he had accomplished by making clear what would have happened had George not been in that community. Each of our lives here in this room today would have been different had Jay not been in our life. Jay was there, and in one way or another, he impacted us, and we are better off because of it. When we heard that Jay had finally passed on from this life, each of us stopped, said a quick prayer of thanks to God for giving us Jay and for healing him. Jay was our conservative movement's quiet big brother. He helped us, he guided us, he instructed us, he encouraged us, and he praised us. Jay Parker was a conservative movement's example of our philosophy and how it, mu it must work in the real world. He was deeply involved in the true nonprofit sector. He lived what so many of us merely talk about. He was active in that piece of society that Richard Cornell talked about in his classic book, Reclaiming the American Dream. Jay was a leader here in Washington and in his beloved city of Philadelphia. He was a major figure 
in the DC Kiwanis Club, Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind, Goodwill, and so much of, and so many others. He was a board member of three major universities: Southeastern University, Gallaudet University, and James Madison University. And his ties to Philadelphia never were severed. He helped scores of people in that city and untold numbers of organizations that really helped people to be better and lead independent lives. He and Dolores moved back to Philadelphia to be near their roots, their beginnings, and with their childhood friends. When you called Jay and wanted to see him, he made time for you. And when you talked with him, nothing else was more important than what you were discussing at that particular time. Today, we have heard and will hear a lot about Jay Parker. And we'll talk about him for a long, long time. We'll remember him as we do a favorite uncle. Jay was unique, and Jay was a friend. We thank Dolores and Ashley for sharing him with us. And we thank God that Jay was here during such an important time in our lives and in the life of our country. We miss you, Jay. Well, Mike Thompson mentioned he had known Jay for 50 years. Uh, I think our next speaker probably tops that. And that's Bob Moffat. Uh, Bob, who uh, is from Pennsylvania, went to LaSalle, uh, got his PhD at Arizona, and is now a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation Center for Health Policy Studies. Bob Moffat. Thank you very much, Roger. Dolores. Ashley, members of the Butler family, Parker family, so. oh, that's right, <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Jay Parker lived and loved greatly. For a public figure, he was a very private man. I know him to be a kind and gentle man, but I can tell you that on matters of conviction, he had the backbone of steel. I first met Jay Parker a late December evening in 1963. The occasion was an organizational meeting of the Young Americans for Freedom at a restaurant in Northeast Philadelphia. You can imagine the smile. Jay greeted me warmly, engaged me in conversation, and he was really delighted to learn that I attended school in Center City, Philadelphia at Roman Catholic High School. At that time, Roman Catholic High School had a basketball team. It, Roman was a basketball powerhouse. And Jay was an avid uh, Philadelphia sports fan. That my father was a detective on the Philadelphia police force also fascinated him. And ladies and gentlemen, he took right away an intense interest in me but I can tell you, he was a real Philly guy. In, in every sense of the word. I was just a high school kid. He looked like an executive out of a Fortune 500 company. The next year, 1964, was pivotal. The big battle was raging between the GOP establishment and the Goldwater insurgents. It was all well underway. William F. Buckley's new organization, the Young Americans for Freedom, supplied the ground troops, and they quickly became the backbone of the Youth for Goldwater that year. Our Philadelphia YAF chapter was largely comprised of mostly Irish Catholic working class kids. The interesting thing was a key ringleader of these Irish urban rebels against the reigning political establishment turned out to be a black Baptist from Fifth and Chunk in South Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, only in America. <laughs> we were just kids. I was 17 years of age. The Goldwater campaign was our first experience in the hard shoe leather business of going door to door in these urban ethnic neighborhoods, handing out literature on behalf of a senator from a far western state that we had only seen in the movies. 
<laughs> anyway, Mike Thompson said something a few minutes ago that actually is very, very true. He brought out the fact that we have this coming holiday season, the America's television screens are going to be filled, of, filled with uh, reruns of that wonderful Hollywood classic, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart. And Mike, I'm glad you brought that up. In 1946, many of you may not know this, but in 1946, that, that movie did not do well uh, in the box office. But today, it endures. Uh, the film endures, and why is that? Well, I think the reason is obvious. The moral of that story is true. It's absolutely true. The good word here, the letter there, that crucial phone call at the right time to the right person changes lives. Everybody in this room knows that that is absolutely true. And for many of us, and for many of the people here in Washington and Philadelphia, for a lot of us, Jay, Jay Parker was George Bailey. You can't dodge the question. A lot of us will have to ask, answer this question for ourselves, but what would we be? Where would we be? What would our lives be like if Jay Parker never was? For me, Jay was generous with his good counsel and advice, but his greatest gift was his encouragement. He encouraged me to become involved in politics. He encouraged me to get involved in public policy. I ended up in the Reagan administration, and as a result, I'm a member of the most impressive alumni association in the modern world. Dorothy Moffat, the detective's wife, was a very shrewd judge of character. Very shrewd. She was extremely fond of Jay Parker. And she told me, I tell you this, Dolores, she told me, on this political business, follow Jay's advice. I did, and it paid off in ways that I could never have imagined. Jay Parker was always there to lend a hand to those of us who were trying to do something good with our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an article of faith that divine providence plays a role in our personal destiny. And so I'm here to tell you that I can thank God I made Jay's acquaintance 52 years ago, and even more so, I earned his friendship. I will never forget him. Thank you very much. These are just powerful testimonies to the profound influence of Jay Parker. My wife, Mary Kay, who's here, and I uh, have spent you know, the last few days just sharing stories and talking about how important Jay was in our lives. Jay and Dolores were in our lives. We were brought together, I think, in a real sense by David Jones, who was a friend of many of us and a mentor to many of us. And we would have the pleasure, Dolores, like you and Jay, of taking trips down to Nashville to spend the weekend with Dave, and sometimes Dave and Corinne, but for us it was just Dave, Corinne had passed, and going to Vanderbilt football games, and just, just wonderful to uh, have been brought together with you, and, and Mary Kay and I just cherish that love and friendship we've had with you both. Our next uh, speaker is Associate Justice Clarence Thomas, Mary Kay and I were privileged a few years after I joined the fund to be able to go to the wonderful, wonderful surprise party that Clarence Thomas managed to pull off at the US Supreme Court for Jay Parker on the occasion of his 60th birthday. And, and it was a highlight in our lives to have been part of that. Please welcome Associate Justice Clarence Thomas. I'll be brief, thank you. Um, Dolores, Ashley, um, friends of Jay, uh, this is a difficult but wonderful opportunity to celebrate Jay's life. 
Um, before I start my brief remarks, there are a couple of things, since there were stories that were shared. I'd like to share just a couple. <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to, but I, I read about Jay at, when I was in law school at Yale in, in the early 1970s. Uh, a black conservative involved in Young Americans for Freedom uh, down here in Virginia. And I thought that was really ridiculous. <laughs> I also read, uh, saw Tom Soule's book, Black Education, Myths and Tragedy, and thought that was particularly ridiculous and threw it away. <laughs> Little did I know, in 1979, when I came here and saw Lincoln Review, that Jay Parker would be the sine qua non of my ability to survive here. Uh, I met Jay right after he and Dee were married. Met Ashley a little after that. He made poor Ashley type every day. <laughs> and Jay was not only a part of my life, he was an integral part of my life, uh, more than I'm at liberty to talk about. But a couple of things. As I told Dee and Ashley, it was Jay in 1980 who told me that I would one day replace Justice Marshall. It was Jay who told me when I declined to go to, uh, did not want to go to Department of Education, that it was put up or shut up, Clarence. <laughs> it was Jay who believed in me throughout that. Um, one minor thing, Jay and I attended the same grammar school in Savannah, Georgia, Haven Home School, which no longer exists. So it was as though divine providence was indeed at work. The same beginning at a tiny little school, segregated school in Savannah, that no longer exists in our lives, come together again at a crucial time in my life when I had literally no prospect. But in any case, uh, most of the time that I set foot in this building, it was to have breakfast with Jay. It was his early morning breakfasts that others have spoken about. They were always early for some reason. <laughs> and when I would arrive at the front door here, Jay would already be here. And he would always greet me the same way with his hat and, hey, buddy, as always, hey, buddy, if I complain to him about someone bothering me, that scoundrel. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, this building warms my heart. And in this city of banalities, of fleeting personalities, and shooting stars, Jay was the North Star if not the Big Dipper. You could find your direction by watching where he was going, or more appropriately, where he was marching, upright, in his fine suit, his vest, and the ever-present fedora. Jay seemed to always have time to help others, and always did it with joy. If you called Jay and asked that he talk with someone having a problem, he seemed almost delighted to do so. But he was also quick to make it clear that he thought we all should be willing to help those in need, even if it just meant we give that person a few minutes of our life. And he expected when he called you to help that you answered. On matters of principle, Jay was immovable, yet he was never unpleasant about it, just firm. In that way, and so many other ways, he was much like my grandfather. In many ways, Jay was 
an uncle, a brother, a cousin, a friend, a buddy. Jay was just Jay. During one of our countless early morning calls, I also called him almost every morning. During one of our countless early morning calls during my years at EELC, I must have told Jay that the Reagan administration was not doing enough to secure freedom. Having no part of this, Jay said, Clarence, freedom comes from God, not Ronald Reagan. <laughs> that was Jay. It was Jay who taught me what it really meant to believe and to live, duty, honor, country. Jay was a patriot. I doubt I know anyone who was as quick and open to helping others, as I said, as Jay. I certainly know that I would not have been able to survive here without his friendship, his counsel, and his guidance. But Jay was even more than this. Perhaps his was that spirit that we all look for in ourselves, his graciousness, his warmth, his courage, his consistency, his character, his basic goodness, made so ever-present and in bold relief by his love of Dee and Ashley. By living the way he did, perhaps he was showing us how to live, not so much for ourselves, but for those things those principles, those people who are more important than we are. And perhaps by living his life so fully, he showed us how we should live ours. It was Lincoln, one of Jay's favorite presidents, it was Lincoln who said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. If you measure the life of this good man in this way, then Jay lived many, many lives since his birth. And in each of us, through memories and the good he has done, he will live eternally. May God bless our friend Jay, and may he continue to watch over Dee, Ashley, and Jay's entire family. Thank you all. Thank you for that moving tribute. Jay truly was a role model for young and old, uh, a man of strong convictions who stuck by them through thick and thin, and really lived his life to the fullest. And as I concluded this op-ed in the Washington Times this morning, he left a legacy through the many young people he inspired to make freedom and service the bookends of a, well, of a life well lived. And he'll be missed by all of us, but as Justice Thomas just said, he's, he's a part of all that we do here and into the future. Jay's cousin, Dennis B. Butler, is now gonna sing a solo, I Want to Be Ready, that he sang in Philadelphia at the service for Jay in September. Dennis Butler. Oh, 
I would not be a sinner. I'll tell you the reason why. Cause if my Lord should call me Lord, I wouldn't be ready to die. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready, Lord, ready to put on my long white robe. I would not be a gambler. I'll tell you the reason why. Cause if my Lord should call on me, Lord, I wouldn't be ready to die. I want to be ready. I want to be Just ready to put on my long white can say, looking at this room of just wonderful faces and loved ones. Um, Mom and I want to sincerely thank you all for your presence here today and your love and support over the last few months. You will never know how much it has meant to all of us. Pop, as I love to call him, would be smiling down today on this wonderful and august gathering of friends and family. Thank you to all the program participants. You all shared wonderful stories and memories of my dear father, and I know that we all will carry those memories going forward. Roger and the fun team, thank you all so much for arranging this and just being there for us. And I want to just acknowledge uh, two family members that are here, my dad's youngest sister, my Aunt Joanne and my Uncle Cornell, if you would wave or stand. Thank you so much for being here and representing the Carver family. I'm not going to get into acknowledging more people because we'd be here all afternoon. So at this point, all I would like to do is say, Mom, thank you so much for just being you. And uh, at this point, I'd like to invite everybody to join us for the reception in the back and have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you again.